Welcome to Craftlit, the podcast for crafters who love books. My name is Heather Ordover, and I'm podcasting from where the Delaware River meets the Old York Road, New Hope, Pennsylvania. Episode 538, Love While Adulting. This episode of Craftlet is brought to you by you. Thank you. Well, hello. How are you? I am well. I am having a very interesting week, actually. We have now trained over a thousand contact tracers in the state of Pennsylvania, which has been really cool. And the people in this wave are just spectacular and a lot of fun, which makes no sense because I've been up at 3 (laughs) a.m. for the last several nights and I'm really tired. Uh, well. So, along with the sleep thing, one piece of newsiness to share with you. I know that sleeping right now is not particularly easy for everybody. I have found something that has worked for me. It gets me to sleep. Staying asleep is a different story, but it is called a Fulext, F-U-L-E-X-T, two-in-one sleep headphone. It is called a two-in-one because you can wear it as a sports headband or as a sleep band. I pull it down over my eyes and use it as a nightshade too. I love this thing. It's super soft. It's super inexpensive. It is Bluetooth. And I have an app that does binaural beats, which I'm not even going to pretend that I can explain right now (laughs) in my current state of not entirely hearness. But it's working, getting me to sleep, almost kind of keeping me asleep. But you can leave it running forever and ever and ever because I had this thing on during the night while listening to a Jasper Ford book. So I listened to the binaural beats to sleep, woke up, switched over to the Jasper Ford book, and kept listening to it on these headphones until like one or two in the afternoon. So its stated battery life, because it's rechargeable, is actually way shorter than the actual battery life on this puppy. So there is a link to that in the show notes in case you are having the same difficulty that I find myself having. We do have several voicemails for this week. The first comes from Ellie, I think. I had a hard time hearing your voice clearly, which I'm sure has a lot more to do with the recording end than your end. And um, she did point out something that I thought I heard myself do. And then I thought, nah, it's okay. And no, it wasn't. It was wrong. Annabella is the woman who is getting it on with Huntington, or at least was. And Arabella, if I remember correctly, is actually the wife in Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norell, I think. The book has been on my mind. And as soon as she pointed this out to me, I went, oh, and that made perfect sense that I would switch those up. I am switching up names that start with the same letter so rapidly lately. I don't know if it's because of this book and all of the H's, but holy smoke, if you put two words with the same first letter, or first couple of letters in front of it, 10 minutes later, I won't be able to remember which was which. Heh, <laughs> hardly the most important thing that's happened lately. Along with Ellie, we have two voicemails, and I'm just going to play them straight through. Two voicemails from Jana Lee. So this episode is named for her comment. Love in the time of adulting is an interesting point that she makes in her voicemails. Well, love and revenge while adulting. So I am going to play those three voicemails for you right now. And I'll pop back with you in just a sec. Here we go. Hello, Heather. This is Addie. Um, I'm both Cedar Visual on Ravelry, and I'm loving the tent of Wild Self Fall. I really love how non romantic it is, that middle ground that you're talking about um, between in air and uh, Weather and Heights or Emily Brunt in general. The one little comment I wanted to point out is I keep on hearing you talk about Annabella, but you're calling her Arabella. And uh, I just thought you might want to switch that up. And 
Anyway, I hope you're doing great and the contact tracing is doing well. And take care. Bye bye. Hi, Heather. This is Janelle, uh, Nits and Mike on Mallory. I had a couple of comments. Um, I just finished listening to um, the 34 through 37 chapters, I think they were, and I had a couple of comments about that. Um, first of all, regarding seatbelts, um, I had to laugh because I remember when my mom and dad got a car that had seatbelts for every single seat in the vehicle. I wasn't very old, but up to that point, the primary car that we had driven around in was the Chevy Nova that my mom had purchased when she started teaching at the um, as a, as an actual teacher at the high school, and she bought it for herself, and it did not have seatbelts. And so we would just sit wherever we wanted to. Um, but the other funny story I have regarding that is that when my husband and his family moved from Salt Lake to Reno, the vehicle that they drove out there had no seatbelts. And my husband was maybe five years old and did not want to miss any of the trip. So he spent the entire trip, which was about 10 hours, standing up in the car because there were no seatbelts. So we can't do that anymore, obviously. And I'm grateful, but I just thought that was a funny, like, experience that he had doing that. Um, moving on to the book, uh, I thought it was really interesting to see what Helen sees as the the pure expression of love versus what her husband sees versus the, is, is the pure expression of love and compare that with, say, Mr. Hargrave's expression of love um, because Mr. Huntington, um, Arthur, is very much the, my feelings make it worthwhile. Like, if I feel this way, then I have to act on it and I have to, you know, I'm in love and she's not my wife and she's married to someone else who happens to be my friend, but I don't care because the, my love is more important, right? It's a very, very selfish and self-centered. And I think Mr. Hargrave is quite a bit the same with his love in the monologue that he kind of gives to Helen at the very end of chapter 37. I think it's 37. Um, he's, he's talking about the pain and the anguish that they're suffering and that he's suffering because of this this love that he feels for her. And he, he tells her, you were the cause of it. Like it's her fault he's suffering because he loves her so much and she won't let him express that. It's very selfish. And like he, both he and Huntingdon, it feels like their, I guess their belief is that the feelings excuse any bad behavior. Oh, you can't get mad at me because I'm in love. And love, love is the best excuse. Love is the only reason, and I see so many people that do this. And Helen, on the other hand, is saying, um, your behavior is a choice. Your feelings should not control your behavior. You're an adult. You get to decide. And even if you feel like not doing something, like, say, not getting up and going to work, you still do it because you're an adult. Or even if you feel like you're in love with this person who's unobtainable for some reason, you don't act on those feelings. Because they would, that's not the way a grown-up behaves. So I find it really interesting to contrast those two. Um, and then the last thing that I liked was the quote a little bit earlier when he, in that same chapter, when he says, don't you want revenge? And she says it would make him no better and me no happier. I think holding a grudge and being angry about someone else's behavior and wanting to get back at them are all very understandable emotions, um, but I, I agree with Helen. I don't think that revenge makes the person that you're getting revenge on any better, and it doesn't make you any happier. Um, and focusing on that and, and focusing on the need for the revenge very often makes you angry and bitter and sad, and I don't think that that's the way that we should live. That's not the way that I would want to live. I think we're happier when we just say, well, that was bad behavior and, you know, I can't control your bad behavior. And so I'm going to focus on what I can control, which is my own behavior. I just finished um, chapter 38 of the Ten in the Wild Shell Hall. And uh, the thing that stood out the most for me, I think, was how Lord Loba's friends, and I'm using that sarcastically, uh, were so supportive of him in this, like, in the previous chapters, you, 
I, I, you may remember that one of the friends was distracting with Lobra so that Arthur Huntington and Lady Lobra Annabella could sneak off into the um, shrubbery. And that's when Helen sees them, for sure, and and clarifies that this is actually going on. And then in this chapter, chapter 38, Millicent's husband, Hargrave? No, it's not Hargrave. One of the H names. Anyway, Millicent's husband is like, I'll stand by you so you can duel it out with him and shoot him. And when Lord Lobra says, no, I'm not interested in that, he makes fun of him and it, it doesn't have any use for him anymore. And it just made me think what a sad, sad life that must be to have friends like that who not only do not have your back, but actively work against your best interests in order to have more entertainment in their own life. Anyway, just a thought. But yeah, again, thank you so much for the work that you do, for the for the books that you provide for us to read and listen to along with you. I really appreciate that. And it is really making a big difference in my personal happiness to have this right now. So thank you. I thought what Janely had to say was just spectacular. Huntington and Hargrave's versions of love in today's chapter, well, certainly Hargrave's version of love in today's chapter, finally arrives at a a logical conclusion, I think, Uh, something that was probably predictable and that, honestly, that you probably predicted in your own mind yourself. I do think there is a point to Huntington and Hargrave's very selfish versions of love that screams romantic capital R and Byronic capital B, which actually ties in beautifully to today's chapter, chapter 39, because there's there's an action by the other H person, Hattersley. There's something that he is doing that Byron was actually rather famous for doing as well, which was really being into having, holding, using against his bed curtains weaponry, whether it was a sword or a gun. And a, a gun at this type would be a muzzle loader that would require that you have a ramrod to get the charge in and keep it in place while you were getting ready to shoot something. Which reminds me, a puss, P-U-S-S, in this case, is a hare, a small rabbit, little girl. So there's a lot of capital R romantic, I think, that goes along with these guys. Stormy, both in their attitudes and in their emotions. Selfish, very taken with the look of things. Uh, Helen being beautiful seems to be the only real thing that Huntington is attracted to in the beginning. I mean, he seems to think she's pleasant enough, I guess. But really, it's you don't make me angry immediately and you're nice to look at. So I guess I'll keep you around. But it did also, I think you can see the connection between Huntington, Hattersley, and Hargrave, and a, Grimsby a little bit, with the characters in Wuthering Heights. So when Helen is saying revenge doesn't doesn't make you or the other person any better, so it's really not worth it, when she adults all over the place at that moment, it reminded me so directly of how Kathy didn't do things in Wuthering Heights. And of course, we see the long-term repercussions of it in, in that book as well. Here we have an extra problem that eventually does show up in Wuthering Heights as well, which is what happens when a child is put in the middle of all of this. And so today's chapter will have some new information about little Arthur, and uh, that's worth paying attention to. There is also a moment, and it goes by super fast, so just keep your ears open for it, where Helen is going to get Hattersley. There's a quick blip at the beginning of her taking action, and then a quick confirmation of that action having landed. And then the text just keeps moving on, and I didn't even notice it the first couple of times through. It was only uh, only the second or third time through the book that I went, oh, oh, okay. There's also a phrase in French, which is par parenthèse, which I know I just butchered, but it's parenthetically. 
So if somebody says something parenthetically, she's just saying it in a way that makes it sound, you know, smart. <laughs> but only if you can pronounce it properly, and then you sound smart. Otherwise, you'll just sound like I did a little while ago. But that's okay, because we're moving on. So we are going to listen to chapter 39 of The Tenant of Wildfell Hall by Anne Bronte, read for us by Mia Daguerre. Here we go. Chapter 39. A Scheme of Escape. My greatest source of uneasiness in this time of trial was my son, whom his father and his father's friends delighted to encourage in all the embryo vices a little child can show, and to instruct in all the evil habits he could acquire. In a word, to make a man of him was one of their staple amusements. And I need say no more to justify my alarm on his account, and my determination to deliver him at any hazard from the hands of such instructors. First I attempted to keep him always with me, or in the nursery, and gave Rachel particular injunctions, never to let him come down to desert as long as these gentlemen stayed. But it was no use. These orders were immediately countermanded and overruled by his father. He was not going to have the little fellow mope to death between an old nurse and a cursed fool of a mother, so the little fellow came down every evening in spite of his cross mamma, and learned to tipple wine like papa, to swear like Mr Hattersley, and to have his own way like a man, and sent mamma to the devil when she tried to prevent him. To see such things done with the roguish naivety of that pretty little child, and to hear such things spoken by that small infantile voice, was as peculiarly piquant and irresistibly droll to them as it was inexpressibly distressing and painful to me, and when he had set the table in a roar, he would look round delightedly upon them all, and add his shrill laugh to theirs. But if that beaming blue eye rested on me, its light would vanish for a moment, and he would say in some concern, Mamma, why don't you laugh? Make her laugh, Papa, she never will. Hence I was obliged to stay among these human brutes, watching an opportunity to get my child away from them, instead of leaving them immediately after the removal of the cloth, as I should always otherwise have done. He was never willingly to go, and I frequently had to carry him away by force, for which he thought me very cruel and unjust, and sometimes his father would insist upon my letting him remain, and then I would leave him to his kind friends, and retire to indulge my bitterness and despair alone, or to rack my brains for a remedy to this great evil. But here again I must do Mr Hargrave the justice to acknowledge that I never saw him laugh at the child's misdemeanours nor heard him utter a word of encouragement to his aspirations after manly accomplishments. But when anything very extraordinary was said or done by the infant profligate, I noticed at times a peculiar expression in his face that I could neither interpret or define, a slight twitching about the muscles of the mouth, a sudden flash in the eye as he darted a sudden glance at the child, and then at me. And then I could fancy there arose a gleam of hard, keen, sombre satisfaction in his countenance at the look of impotent wrath and anguish he was too certain to behold in mine. But on one occasion, when Arthur had been behaving particularly ill, and Mr Huntington and his guests had been particularly provoking and insulting to me in their encouragement of him, and I particularly anxious to get him out of the room, and on the very point of demeaning myself by a burst of uncontrollable passion, Mr Hargrave suddenly rose from his seat, with an aspect of stern determination, lifted the child from his father's knee, where he was sitting half tipsy, cocking his head and laughing at me and extricating me with words he little knew the meaning of, handed him out of the room, and set it down in the hall, held the door open for me, gravely bowed as I withdrew, and closed it after me. I heard high words of exchange between him and his already half-inebriated host as I departed, leading away my bewildered and disconcerted boy. But this should not continue. My child must not be abandoned to his corruption. Better far that he should live in poverty and obscurity with a fugitive mother than in luxury and affluence with such a father. These guests might not be with us long, but they would return again, and he, the most injurious of the whole, his child's worst enemy, would still remain. I could endure it for myself but for my son it must be born no longer. The world's opinion and the feelings of my friends must be alike unheeded here, at least alike unable to deter me from my duty. 
But where should I find an asylum, and how obtain sustenance for us both? Oh, I would take my precious charge at early dawn, take the coach to Manchester, flee the port of Liverpool, cross the Atlantic, and seek a quiet, humble home in New England, where I would support myself and him by the labour of my hands. The pallet and the easel, my darling playmates once, must be my sober toil fellows now. But was I sufficiently skilful as an artist to obtain my livelihood in a strange land without fellows and without recommendation? No, I must wait a little. I must labour hard to improve my talent and to produce something worthwhile as a specimen of my powers, something to speak favourably for me, whether as an actual painter or a teacher. Brilliant success, of course, I did not look for, but some degree of security from positive failure was indispensable. I must not take my son to starve. Then I must have money for the journey and the passage and some little to support us in our retreat, in case I should be unsuccessful at first. And not too little either, for who could tell how long I might have to struggle with the indifference or neglect of others, or my own inexperience, or inability to suit their tastes? What should I do then? Apply to my brother and explain my circumstance and my resolve to him? No, no, even if I told him all my grievances, which I should be very reluctant to do, he would be certain to disapprove the step. It would seem like madness to him as it would to my uncle and aunt or to Millicent. No, I must have patience and gather and hoard of my own. Rachel should be my only confidant. I thought I could persuade her into the scheme and she should help me for first to find out a picture dealer in some distant town. Then, through her means, I would privately sell what pictures I had on hand that would do for such a purpose and some of those I should thereafter paint. Besides this, I would contrive to dispose of my jewels, not the family jewels, but the few I brought with me from home, and those my uncle gave me on my marriage. A few months' arduous toil might well be borne by me with such an end in view, and in the interim my son could not be much more injured than he was already. Having formed this resolution, I immediately set to work to accomplish it. I might possibly have been induced to act cool upon it afterwards, or perhaps to keep weighing the pros and cons in my mind till the latter overbalanced the former, and I was driven to relinquish the project altogether, or to delay the execution to an indefinite period, had not something occurred to confirm me in that determination which I still adhere, which I still think I did well to form, and shall do better to execute. Since Lord Lowborough's departure, I had regarded the library as entirely my own, a secure retreat at all hours of the day, None of our gentlemen had the smallest pretensions to literary taste, except Mr Hargrave, and he at present was quite contented with the newspapers and periodicals of the day. And if, by any chance, he should look in here, I felt assured he would soon depart on seeing me, for instead of becoming less cool and distant towards me, he had become decidedly more so since the departure of his mother and sisters, which was just what I wished. Here, then, I set up my easel, and here I worked at the canvas from daylight till dusk, with very little intermission, saving when pure necessity or my duties to little Arthur called me away, for I still thought proper to devote a portion of every day exclusively to his instruction and amusement. But contrary to my expectation, on the third morning, while I was thus employed, Mr Hargrave did look in and did not immediately withdraw on seeing me. He apologised for his intrusion and said he was only come for a book, but when he had got it, he condescended to cast a glance over my picture. Being a man of taste, he had something to say on the subject, as well as another, and having modestly commented on it, without much encouragement from me, he proceeded to expatiate on the art in general. Receiving no encouragement in that either, he dropped it, but did not depart. "'You don't give us much of your company, Mrs Huntington,' observed he, after a brief pause, during which I went on coolly mixing and tempering my colours. And I cannot wonder at it, for you must be heartily sick of us all. I myself am so thoroughly ashamed of my companions, and so weary of their irrational conversations and pursuits, now that there is no one to humanise them and keep them in check, since you have justly abandoned us to our own devices, that I think I shall presently withdraw from amongst them, probably within this week. And I cannot suppose you will regret my departure. He paused. I did not answer. Probably he added with a smile, your only regret on the subject will be that I do not take all my companions along with me. I flatter myself at times that, 
though among them I am not of them. But it is natural that you should be glad to get rid of me. I may regret this, but I cannot blame you for it. I shall not rejoice at your departure, for you can conduct yourself like a gentleman, said I, thinking it but right to make some acknowledgement for his good behaviour. But I must confess I shall rejoice to bid adieu to the rest, inhospitable as it may appear. No one can blame you for such an avowal, replied he gravely. Not even the gentlemen themselves, I imagine. I'll just tell you, he continued, as if actuated by a sudden resolution. What was said last night in the dining room after you left us? Perhaps you will not mind it, as you are so very philosophical on certain points, he added with a slight sneer. They were talking about Lord Lowborough and his delectable lady, the cause of whose sudden departure is no secret amongst them, and her character is so well known to them that, nearly related to me as she is, I could not attempt to defend it. God curse me, he muttered, per parenthes, if I don't have vengeance for this. If the villain must disgrace the family, he must blazon it abroad to every low-bred knave of his acquaintance. I beg your pardon, Mrs. Huntingdon. Well, they were talking of these things, and some of them remarked that, as she was separated from her husband, he might see her again when he pleased. Thank you, said he. I've had enough of her for the present. I'm not troubled to see her unless she comes to me. Then what do you mean to do, Huntington, when we're gone? said Ralph Attersley. Do you mean to turn from the error of your ways and be a good husband, a good father and so forth, as I do when I shall get shut of you and all these rollicking devils you call your friends? I think it's time and your wife's fifty times too good for you, you know. And he added some praise of you, which you would not thank me for repeating, nor him for uttering, proclaiming it aloud as he did without delicacy or discrimination, in an audience where it seemed a profanity to unto your name himself utterly incapable of understanding or appreciating your real excellences. Huntington, meanwhile, sat quietly drinking his wine or looking smilingly into his glass and offering no interruption or reply, till Hattersley shouted, Do you hear me, ma'am? Yes, go on, said he. Nay, I've done, replied the other. I only want to know if you intend to take my advice. What advice? To turn over a new leaf, you double-dyed scoundrel, shouted Ralph and beg your wife's pardon and be a good boy for the future. My wife? What wife? I have no wife, replied Huntington, looking innocently up from his glass. Or if I have, look, you gentlemen, I value her so highly that any among you that can fancy her may have her unwelcome. You may, by Jove, my blessing into the bargain. I, uh, somebody asked if he really meant what he said, upon which he solemnly swore he did, and no mistake. What do you think of that, Mrs Huntington? asked Mr. Hargrave after a short pause, during which I had felt he was keenly examining my half-averted face. I say, replied I calmly, that what he prizes so lightly will not be long in his possession. You cannot mean that you will break your heart and die for the detestable conduct of an infamous villain like that. By no means. My heart is too thoroughly dried to be broken in a hurry, and I mean to live as long as I can. Will you leave him, then? Yes. When and how? he asked eagerly. When I'm ready and how I can manage it most effectually. But your child? My child goes with me. He will not allow it. I shall not ask him. Ah, then it's a secret flight you meditate. But with whom, Mrs Huntington? With my son and possibly his nurse. Alone and unprotected. But where can you go? What can you do? He'll follow you and bring you back. I've laid my plans too well for that. Let me once get clear of Grassdale and I shall consider myself safe. Mr Hargrave advanced one step towards me, looked me in the face and drew his breath to speak. But that look, that heightened colour, that sudden sparkle in the eye made my blood rise in wrath. I abruptly turned away and, snatching up my brush, began to dash away at my canvas with rather too much energy for the good of the picture. Mrs Huntington he said with bitter solemnity. You are cruel, cruel to me, cruel to yourself. Mr Hargrave, remember your promise. I must speak. My heart will burst if I don't. I've been silent long enough. You must hear me, cried he, boldly intercepting my retreat to the door. You tell me you owe no allegiance to your husband. He openly declares himself weary of you and calmly gives you up to anybody that will take you. And you're about to leave him. No one will believe that you go alone. All the world will say she has left him at last and who can wonder at it? 
few can blame her, fewer still can pity him. But who is the companion of her flight? Thus you will have no credit for your virtue, if you call it such. Even your best friends will not believe in it, because it's monstrous, and not to be credited, but by those who suffer from the effects of it, such cruel torments that they know to be indeed reality. But what can you do in the cold, rough world alone? You, a yearning, inexperienced woman, delicately nurtured and utterly, in a word, you would advise me to stay where I am, interrupted I. Well, I'll see about it. By all means, leave him, he cried earnestly. But not alone, Helen, let me protect you. Never. Well, heaven spares my reason, replied I, snatching away the hand he had presumed to seize and press between his own. But he was in for it now, and he had fairly broken the barrier. He was completely roused and determined to hazard all for victory. I must not be denied, exclaimed he vehemently, and seizing both my hands he held them very tight, but dropped upon his knee and looked up in my face with a half-imploring, half-imperious gaze. You have no reason now. You're flying in the face of heaven's decrees. God has designed me to be your comfort and protector. I feel it. I shall know it as certainly as if a voice from heaven declared he twain shall be one flesh. And you have spurned me from you. Let me go, Mr. Hargrave, I said sternly. But he only tightened his grasp. Let me go, I repeated, quivering with indignation. His face was almost opposite the window as he knelt. With a slight start, I saw him glance towards it. Then a gleam of malicious triumph hit his countenance. Looking over my shoulder, I beheld a shadow just retiring round the corner. That is Grimsby, he said deliberately. He will report what he's seen to Huntington and all the rest, with such embellishments as he thinks proper. He has no love for you, Mrs. Huntington, no reverence for your sex, no belief in virtue, no admiration for its image. He will give such a version of this story as will leave no doubt at all about your character in the minds of those who hear it. Your fair fame is gone, and nothing that I or you can say can ever retrieve it. But give me the power to protect you, and show me the villain that dares to insult. No one has ever dared to insult me as you are doing now, said I, at length releasing my hands and recoiling from him. I do not insult you, cried he. I worship you. You are my angel, my divinity. I lay my powers at your feet, and you must and shall accept them, he exclaimed impetuously, starting to his feet. I will be your consoler and defender, and if your conscience upbraid you for it, say I overcame you, and you could not choose but yield. I never saw a man so terribly excited. He precipitated himself towards me, I snatched up my pallet knife and held it against him. This startled him, and he stood and gazed at me in astonishment. I dare say I looked as fierce and resolute as he. I moved to the bell and put my hand upon the cord. This tamed him still more. With a half-authoritative, half-depreciating wave of the hand, he sought to deter me from ringing. Stand off then, said I. He stepped back. Now listen to me. I don't like you. I continued as deliberately and emphatically as I could to give the greater efficacy to my words. And if I were divorced from my husband, or if he were dead, I would not marry you. There now, I hope you're satisfied. His face grew blancher with anger. I am satisfied, he replied with bitter emphasis, that you are the most cold-hearted, unnatural, ungrateful woman I ever yet beheld. Ungrateful, sir. Ungrateful. No, Mr. Hargrave. I'm not. For all the good you ever did me, or ever wished to do, I most sincerely thank you. For all the evil you have done me, and all you would have done, I pray God to pardon you and make you of a better mind. Here the door was thrown open, and Messrs Huntington and Hattersley appeared without. The latter remained in the hall, busy with his ramrod and his gun. The former walked in and stood with his back to the fire, surveying Mr Hargrave and me, particularly the former, with a smile of insupportable meaning, and accompanied as it was by the impudence of his brazen brow and the sly malicious twinkle of his eye. "'Well, sir?' said Hargrave interrogatively, and with the air of one prepared to stand on the defensive. "'Well, sir,' returned his host. "'We want to know if you're at liberty to join us in a go at the pheasants, Walter,' interposed Hattersley from without. "'Come, there shall be nothing shot beside, except a puss or two. 
I'll vouch for that. Walter did not answer, but walked to the window to collect his faculties. Arthur uttered a low whistle and followed him with his eyes. A slight flush of anger rose to Hargrave's cheek, but in a moment he turned calmly round and said carelessly, I came here to bid farewell to Mrs Huntington and tell her I must go tomorrow. Oh, you're mighty sudden in your resolution. What takes you off so soon, may I ask? Business, returned he, repelling the other's incredulous sneer with a glance of scornful defiance. Very good, was the reply, and Hargrave walked away. Thereupon Mr Huntington, gathering his coat and laps under his arms and setting his shoulder against the mantelpiece, turned to me, and addressing me in a low voice, scarcely above his breath, poured forth a volley of the vilest and grossest abuse it was possible for the imagination to conceive or the tongue to utter. I did not attempt to interrupt him, but my spirit kindled within me, and when he had done I replied, If your accusation were true, Mr Huntington, how dare you blame me? She's hit it, by Jove! cried Hattersley, rearing his gun against the wall and stepping into the room. He took his precious friend by the arm and attempted to drag him away. Come, my lad, he muttered. True or false, you've no right to blame her, you know. Nor him either, after what you said last night, so come along. There was something implied here that I could not endure. Dare you suspect me, Mr Hattersley, said I, almost beside myself with fury. Nay, nay, I had to suspect no one. It's all right. It's all right, so come along, Huntington, you blackguard. She can't deny it, cried the gentleman thus addressed, grinning in mingled rage and triumph. She can't deny it, if all her life depended on it. And muttering some more abusive language, he walked into the hall and took up his hat and gun from the table. I scorn to justify myself to you, said I. But you, turning to Hattersley, if you presume to have any doubts on the subject, ask Mr Hargrave. At this they simultaneously burst into a rude laugh that made my whole frame tingle to the fingers' ends. Where is he? I'll ask him myself, said I, advancing towards them. Suppressing a new burst of merriment, Hattersley pointed to the outer door. It was half open. His brother-in-law was standing on the front without. Mr Hargrave, will you please to step this way, said I. He turned and looked at me in grave surprise. Step this way, if you please, I repeated in so determined a manner that he could not or did not choose to resist its authority. Somewhat reluctantly, he ascended the steps and advanced a pace or two into the hall. And tell those gentlemen, I concluded, these men, whether or not I yielded to your solicitations. I don't understand you, Mrs Huntington. You do understand me, sir, and I charge you upon your honour as a gentleman, if you have any, to answer truly. Did I or did I not? No, muttered he, turning away. Speak up, sir, they can't hear you. Did I grant your request? No, you did not. No, I'll be sworn she didn't, said Hattersley, or he'd never look so black. I'm willing to grant you the satisfaction of a gentleman, Huntington, said Mr Hargrave, calmly addressing his host, but with a bitter sneer upon his countenance. Go to the deuce, replied the latter, with an impatient jerk of the head. Hargrave withdrew with a look of cold disdain, saying... You know where to find me, should you feel disposed to send a friend. Muttered oaths and curses were all the anger this intimation obtained. Now, Huntington, you see, said Hattersley, clear as the day. I don't care what he sees, said I, or what he imagines. But you, Mr Hattersley, when you hear my name belied and slandered, will you defend it? I will, blast me if I don't. I instantly departed and shut myself into the library. What could possess me to make such a request of such a man? I cannot tell. But drowning men catch at straws, and they had driven me desperate between them. I hardly knew what I said. There was no other to preserve me my name from being blackened and dispersed among this nest of boon companions, and threw them perhaps into the world. And besides my abandoned wretch of a husband, the base, malignant Grimsby and the false villain Hargrave, this boorish ruffian, coarse and brutal as he was, shone like a glowworm in the dark amongst his fellow worms. What a scene this was! Could I ever have imagined that I should be doomed to bear such insults under my own roof, to hear such things spoken in my presence? They had spoken to me and of me, and by those who aggregated to themselves the name of gentlemen. And could I have imagined that I should have been able to endure it as calmly, and to repel their insults as firmly and boldly as I had done? 
A hardness such as this is taught by rough experience and despair alone. Such thoughts as these chase one another through my mind as I paced to and fro the room and longed, oh how I longed to take my child and leave them now without an hour's delay. But it could not be. There was work before me, hard work that must be done. Then let me do it, said I, and lose not a moment in vain repinings and idle chafings against my fate and those who influence it. And conquering my agitation with a powerful effort, I immediately resumed my task and laboured hard all day. Mr Hargrave did depart on the morrow, and I've never seen him since. The others stayed on for two or three weeks longer, but I kept aloof of them as much as possible, and still continued my labour, and have continued it, with almost unbatable ardour, to the present day. I soon acquainted Rachel with my design, confiding all my motives and intentions to her ear, and much to my agreeable surprise found little difficulty in persuading her to enter into my views. She's a sober, cautious woman, but she so hates her master and so loves her mistress and her nursling, that after several ejaculations, a few faint objections and many tears and lamentations that I should be brought to such a pass, she applauded my resolution and consented to aid me with all her might, on one condition only, that she might share my exile. Otherwise she was utterly inexorable, regarding it as perfect madness for me and Arthur to go alone. With touching generosity, she modestly offered to aid me with her little hoard of savings, hoping I would excuse her for the liberty, but really, if I would do her the favour to accept it as a loan, she would be very happy. Of course, I could not think of such a thing. But now, thank heaven, I've gathered a little hoard of my own, and my preparations are so far advanced that I'm looking forward to a speedy emancipation. Only let the stormy severity of this winter weather be somewhat abated, and then, some morning, Mr Huntington will come down to a solitary breakfast table, and perhaps be clamouring through the house for his invisible wife and child, when they're some fifty miles on their way to the western world. Or maybe more, for we shall leave him hours before dawn, and it is not probable he will discover the loss of both until the day is far advanced. I am fully alive to the evils that may and must result upon the step I am about to take, but I never waver in my resolution, because I never forget my son. It was only this morning, while I pursued my usual employment, he was sitting at my feet, quietly playing with the shreds of canvas I had thrown upon the carpet. But his mind was otherwise occupied, for in a while he looked up wistfully in my face, and gravely asked, "Mamma, why are you wicked? Who told you I was wicked, love? Rachel! No, Arthur, Rachel never said so, I'm certain. Well, then it was Papa, replied he thoughtfully. Then, after a reflective pause, he added, At least, I'll tell you how it was I got to know. When I'm with Papa, if I say Mamma wants me, or Mamma says I'm not to do something, he tells me to do it. He always says, Mamma be damned. And Rachel says it's only wicked people that are damned. So, Mamma, that's why I think you must be wicked. And I wish you wouldn't. My dear child, I'm not. Those are bad words and wicked people often say them of others better than themselves. Those words cannot make people be damned, nor show they deserve it. God will judge us by our own thoughts and deeds, and not by what others say about us. And when you hear such words spoken, Arthur, remember never to repeat them. It is wicked to say such things of others, and not to have them said against you. Then it is Papa that is wicked, said he ruefully. Papa is wrong to say such things, and you would be very wrong to imitate him, now that you know better. What is imitate? To do as he does. Does he know better? Perhaps he does, but that's nothing to you. And if he doesn't, you ought to tell him, Mamma. I have told him. The little moralist paused and pondered. I tried in vain to divert his mind from the subject. I'm sorry Papa is wicked he said mournfully at length, for I don't want him to go to hell. And so saying, he burst into tears. I consoled him with the hope that perhaps his papa would alter and become good before he died. But is it not time to deliver him from such a parent? That little kid, little Arthur, that was some interesting logic thinking he did, because he was 
putting pieces together from completely different people in completely different conversations. And Helen, being an excellent mother, listens to the whole thing instead of getting mad at him or punishing him for what he said, which made me think so directly of Huckleberry Finn, who also has to piece things together through his own innate logic and arrives at the correct conclusion for us, which is that Jim is actually a human being and worth saving, and arrives at the wrong conclusion as far as society is concerned, which is the opposite. And therefore, Huck assumes that by doing what we know to be the right thing, he will go to hell. And here we have little Arthur thinking that his mother is going to go to hell because the way things have been explained to him, logically, this is what his dad said, this is what Rachel said, this is what's going to happen to you, mom, but you don't seem like someone who should be getting damned, so I'm confused. Smart little kid, great mom to listen without judgment all the way along. It also, I think, tempers some of the, well, what, what everybody else was perceiving as harshness and strictness on her part when we first started the book and didn't really know what was going on with her. It makes her relationship with Arthur make an awful lot more sense because clearly when they are alone together, she is lovely and calm and non-quick-to-judgy behavior. She's, she's solid. And whatever the outside world thinks, they can just stuff it because they're wrong. This, of course, goes along with the phrase, everyone is fighting a war you know nothing about. So true with Helen. And the thing with Hargrave, okay, I don't think I am pushing into Jack and Jill land to say, it seemed to me like he was threatening her at the end. And Grimsby having seen them, did he set that up? I mean, I wouldn't put it past any of them. I don't know. I don't know if he set that up. But either way, it backfired on him. And whatever it was that he really was implying, whether it was you have no choice in the matter, babe, or not, Helen picks up her palette knife, which is kind of useless as a weapon-ish, but if it's really good and really flexible, you could, you could still do some serious damage scraping that thing across, say, somebody's wrist. It would not be that hard to inflict at least pain, if not damage. And Helen picked up a weapon. I mean, dang, I was so surprised. And kind of cheering on the inside, which is horrible because, of course, driving somebody to the point where they have to pick up a weapon is appalling and awful. And I would rather live in a world that doesn't have any weapons. That would be nice. So there's the part of me that's kind of horrified, but also the big part of me that's like, yeah, get him, because he's been such a jerk. But then we have the thing with Hattersley. And this is where the chapter for me just got so interesting. So he comes in teasing Helen by way of Huntingdon. So really, it's a way just to get at Huntingdon, which seems to be sport for them. And, and says to Huntingdon in front of Helen, true or false, you've no right to blame her. You know, not him either after what you said last night. So he's on the side of, his, of the angels, his better angels here at this point, And she is stunned that Hattersley would actually think she would do anything with Hargrave. And he's, he and, and Huntington both are like, yeah, 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 whatever. You're just being a hysterical little lady right now. It's not that big a deal. But she obviously is going to take it very seriously, brings Hargrave back. I know you all know this because you just listened to it. But she gets Hargrave to say out loud that she didn't cave, which honestly, I was not necessarily thinking he was going to man up on that one. But he did. And then trying to stay gentlemanly-like, I guess, says to Huntington, yeah, I did come on to her. And if you want to duel, the satisfaction of a gentleman, if you want to duel over this, I guess that's fine. Meh. Huntington, of course, doesn't want to be bothered with anything that much work. Hargrave leaves. Good. Bye bye But then Hattersley turns to Huntington. And says, now, Huntington, you see, clear as the day. See, your wife is innocent. She steps in before 
Her husband can say anything. She steps in. I don't care what he sees or what he imagines. But you, Hattersley, you pillock, when you hear my name belied and slandered, will you defend it? This is how it's written. I will, period. Blast me if I don't. Exclamation point. She turns on her heel and leaves, and that's the end of that. She gets Hattersley to basically, and he's sober right now, say that he will defend her name if anybody else comes around and slanders it. Of course, that means Grimsby, who isn't here right now, but was out spying. So he's going to wind up having to have a little talking to to Grimsby, I imagine. But that's, that's huge. Hattersley is the one guy who never seemed to have a horse in any race. He was just kind of screwing around, thinking his humor was actually funny to everyone, I guess. And here he is, sobering up super fast. I will. Yes, I will defend your name. Heck yeah. She's pretty impressive. I mean, she's really impressive. And without becoming overwrought or hysterical or a witch with a capital B, she's just on it, taking care of her life, taking care of her kid, getting a plan together, got Rachel on her side. She is on it. You can imagine just what kind of a frisson, a, a thrill could have gone through a woman in 1840 when reading this, a woman who is in a similar situation to Helen. I mean, first off, the book's being reasonably honest about what it looks like to be in an abusive relationship. Second off, we have a woman who has no legal agency at all right now in her time and place, absolutely taking control of her own future and her own body. I, it's, it is extraordinary. And it doesn't surprise me at all that this book didn't do as well as Jane Eyre or even Wuthering Heights. But it's so important to see Helen do this. And she, Anne Bronte is so good. She doesn't belabor it like I am doing right now. She doesn't spend a whole lot of time either praising Helen, like pointing out with big neon sign, like, look, 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 look at all the good stuff she did. She just did this. Isn't that cool? She just does it and moves on because there's more story. And it's, uh, I just love it. So yay for Helen. Yay for little Arthur. Yay for little Arthur talking to his mom and his mom listening. Yay for everybody. Look at, we have a chapter and it ended kind of happy. Ask. It's pretty cool. Not a bad thing for a Friday. All right. There we go. Have a great one. I will talk to you soon. Take care of each other. Wear a mask. Bye. If you like what you heard today, please leave a review over at iTunes. Join us on Facebook. Meet up with the knitters on Craftlet's Corner of Ravelry. Stay in the know on Instagram or add your name to our mailing list, which I promise will never spam you. In fact, you probably want to buy a lottery ticket on any day that you get a message from the Craftlet mailing list because that'll be a special day. And remember, if your hands are too busy to pick up a book, at least you can turn one on. <laughs>